Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program created in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Rich Robbins of Upper West Strategies, along with Ellen Jorgensen of Onica Biosciences and Emmanuel Cruz of A2A Pharma, talking about New York City's Life Science Intern Program. All right, I, I see it's 9.01. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Land, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're joining us for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. Um, a special thank you to our partners at McDermott, Will, and Emory. Um, we really appreciate their partnering with us to help us bring um, four additional weeks of our virtual breakfast series to you. Um, this morning, we're going to talk um, LifeSci NYC intern program. I know it feels like we are just finishing up summer, but this is the prime time for you all to start thinking about um, the potential for hosting life science interns um, next summer. Um, as far away as that seems, it's really not, as I'm sure Rich will tell us when we get to our conversation. Um, we're excited to have Rich, Ellen, and Emmanuel here today with us. And I am going to, oh, I almost forgot my normal housekeeping. Um, so remember everyone, please ask questions um, as we go through the conversation today. Put those questions in either the Q&A box or the chat feature. And Derek and I will get to them as we go through our conversation with that turn it over to Derek to do our more formal introduction of our lovely guest. Okay, good morning. So Rich, Ellen, Emmanuel, it's fantastic to have you here. And, you know, this is something that, you know, as part of the, you know, LifeSci NYC initiative was a huge announcement when it came out. And one of the pieces of this that I think is really interesting to talk about is, you know, it, it it's, the, it's the talent development portion, right? It's, it's the workforce piece. It's not you know, it's it's not real estate, it's not the venture fund, but it actually deals with you know how do we how do we better integrate uh, people into the companies that are going to get started in New York, and I think one of the cool things that we can talk about is the you know is the thread that runs through the ecosystem and how this actually uh, affected not only the companies but the people involved with it. So I think we've got a great substrate to talk about today. Um, and since there's three of you, why don't we start with some kind of brief introductions? So why don't we just uh, give a little bit of an intro about uh, who you are and what you do now and what your relationship is to the program. Great, thank you very much, Derek. And uh, thank you both Derek and Jennifer for having us and for featuring the program. Um, great to get the attention. And um, you know, just thrilled that um, my company, Upper West Strategies has been able to work on the program. Um, so just quick origin of the program, not of myself, but um, New York City recognized we have all the pieces of a thriving life science industry. We've got world-class universities, hospitals, access to Wall Street, but that we weren't competing with the Bay Area and the Boston, Cambridge, and Massachusetts area. And in 2016, the Partnership Fund for New York City issued a report calling the life science industry the next big industry in New York City. Uh, as you mentioned, Derek, uh, in 2016, Mayor de Blasio announced a $500 million 10-year initiative to build out the life science industry. And um, that was doubled in June to a billion dollars. And a critical part of that is the talent development piece, making sure that um, as the industry grows, there's um, a pipeline of talent to fill the important jobs. And, and even more importantly, that New York City students are prepared for all the great jobs that are being developed in the industry. And uh, my company, Upper West Strategies, was selected to um, develop and run the program. Fantastic. So uh, Ellen, why don't we go over to you? OK, mine, mine is a little long, because I think, actually, my involvement started when I was a teenager in New York looking for an internship <laughs> as a college student and not yes. being able to find one since my parents were artists. So I have a real soft spot for kids in New York City who are just like me, who have no contacts in the industry and who desperately want to get into a lab. And so um, my background is the biotech industry. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist. I've spent my life in the industry. And um, I did a segue uh, a few years ago for about 10 years into the community lab. Um, so I ran a nonprofit. Uh, and now I'm back in the biotech industry uh, at Annika Biosciences, which is a, um, a startup biotech company in Industry City in Brooklyn now. Mm -hmm. right, Thanks, so Alan. Over to you. Hey, Derek. Haven't seen you in a while. Great to see you. I know. Um, Good to so, see you too. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, once again, very, very glad to be here. Thank you. I've been following the, the New York bio series for a while. So this is great. Um, I'm Emmanuel, grew up in Jersey, and then I went to school in South Florida in Tampa, where I was lucky enough to, uh, to get into the master's program at Cornell Tech University. And uh, that officially set my feet on New York City soil, which was amazing. And coming out of Cornell Tech, similar to what Ellen mentioned, you know, no connections to the biotech industry, chemistry background, my master's was in computer science, and I wanted to blend these two fields. But it seemed all the opportunities kind of being, you know, shoveled towards me were all machine learning, software engineering internships purely in the, in the Google, Facebook, uh, Bloomberg type companies that, that acquire a lot of this talent. And uh, frankly, I, I really wanted to find this and I, I couldn't see anything. But one day I got an email from uh, Sharon, Sharon Kaplan with uh, Upper West. And uh, I applied to a, to a position with a biology group, I actually got rejected because they're like, you're not great for this. But they said, well, why don't you look at this opportunity with this company called A2A Pharmaceuticals? And that was uh, two and a half years ago now. And so since then, I joined A2A Pharma, doing exactly what I dreamed of doing, mixing chemistry and computer science to make novel oncology drugs. And uh, we've had some phenomenal progress over the past two and a half years, and I've been so glad to be a part of it. So uh, thankful for everybody here. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we've got we've got a lot to dig into because I think both of your stories hit on hit on things that are that are really important. Um, so, but to, to start, Rich, I want to get a little bit more about kind of the genesis of the program. So, you know, how did, how did you get involved? What were your kind of initial thoughts just going into it? Uh, and, you know, did it, did it either live up to or exceed those thoughts? Did you, you know, how did you look at this when it first started? Yeah, great question. And, um, you know, for me, this is kind of my third career. I did a, a career in entertainment marketing, went to business school, worked at at t for 10 years. And at at and I started doing some internship work. I um, both sponsored a tech program run by the New York Tech Meetup called Startup Summer, getting New York City youth involved in, um, in startups um, as interns. Also, um, through the State Department, brought Iraqis to the United States to work at uh, at and which is a really interesting program. Uh, but then when I started my business, Upper West Strategies, I uh, started doing internship work for the New York City Department of Education and had done a number of projects for the Department of Education, saw the request for proposals from the New York City Economic Development Corporation for this program, went to the RFP meeting and had the, the luck encounter of meeting Anita Kishore, who's been my partner in developing the program and is brilliant. She's a PhD uh, biophysical chemist and has a lot of great experience both as a career coach and um, in consulting in industry um, and just was the perfect per partner for the program. Uh, so we bid on the project and we're lucky enough to get selected by EDC. And I give EDC a ton of credit for building the program and, and for the overall Life Science NYC initiative. But uh, they selected us in the summer of 2017. Uh, we basically treated it like a strategy consulting project, went out, spoke with over 60 people in the industry just to figure out, you know, we've got this platform. How do we make the best use of it to help both the industry, to help the city, and especially to help New York City youth? And we developed a blueprint for the program. And shortly after that, hired uh, Sharon Kaplan, who Emmanuel mentioned as the program director and just built the program from the ground up. Uh, and it's been, um, it's been amazingly successful and it's gone incredibly according to plan. Uh, if you look back at the blueprint we developed, you know, we're, that's still our, uh, our roadmap for the program. And it's still, uh, you know, we're, we're building it just as, uh, as we had planned back then. Yeah. Mitch, no, did I... you look at when you were when you were doing the sort of the consulting, right? Your research, your research piece, right? On what a what a good internship program. Are there other programs that that exist across the U.S. that were instructive, or is this something that's really novel for New York City? You know, great question. Uh, there's a program in Massachusetts, Massachusetts Life Science uh, Challenge, that's a, a direct analog to this program. And we actually, as we were bidding on the project, spoke with the people who run the, uh, the internship program in Massachusetts, got a lot of great ideas, uh, had to adapt ours to reflect the, the difference in the New York City market, where their industry is very mature. 
So when we spoke with them, they said that they get calls virtually every day from companies wanting to host interns. Whereas for us, the biggest challenge was and still is finding companies who are interested in hosting interns. Uh, but so is it, there, got, it was a great got. model and uh, we're still in touch with them and you know, they're, they're great partners in the same effort. Is there a bit of, of what Emmanuel described and what I would call kind of the volume problem where, where, the, where tech basically has, you know, just really armies of people that they need to hire and they will take, you know, kind of the smartest people in the room, tech background, coding background, whatever. Does that make it a little harder to compete against in terms of, of finding, you know, finding enough uh, students or finding enough opportunities here? There's really no challenge in finding great students. Uh, New York City is blessed with thousands of great science students. So there might be some very particular fields where it's harder to find people. But um, we projected in the first year, we had projected 300 applicants. And in 2018, we had 550 applicants. This past year, we had 2,400 applicants. Wow. So we have effectively infinite students. And with really with any internship program, the challenge is finding enough companies to host the students. Yeah. So if anyone's out there, if you're interested in great students, we've got them. Uh, and there are really a large number of students looking for great opportunities. Well, so I'd I, love I, to I, jump in with a perspective yeah. on that too. Um, so when I was running, my, my nonprofit was a community bio lab. And one of the things that we did was we served a lot of the, these students in, in New York City. And I talked to both a lot of uh, the programs that are turning these students out, like these biotech um, degrees. Uh, and the students, the biggest challenge is finding um, a place to get hands-on experience in a lab because uh, they'll have all of this, this education, but they've never had any practical experience past a lab in school. And that's a huge barrier for them getting hired. And so they were always complaining that they couldn't find. So I would run these teams that had, we, we would enter genetic engineering competitions and stuff. So I was able to give them a little bit of experience, but that, that was the thing. There are always good students coming out of these programs and they're always looking for somewhere to get this, this hands-on experience that they just can't get in school. It's hugely yep. important to connect them with companies. So to go a little further with that, can you talk a little bit about what some of the, either the perceived or real barriers are from a host standpoint? I mean, I can, I can imagine that a host, that people that are a little bit hesitant may look at them and say, I don't know that I have time to train them. It's probably, I imagine there's a lot of concerns about the host resources side, but can you talk a little bit about that in terms of your experience in ter of hosting? students and bringing them in? I think that the, the two barriers are, um, if the organization is small, like my nonprofit was, it was money. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely important that LifeSci New York was able to give us um, a stipend or a grant so that, that the students would be paid by that and not out of the nonprofit's budget. Right. So that was extraordinarily helpful. Um, the the barrier there was not as great because we existed to train people. So we yeah. were always training people that had no experience. Now that I'm in my startup company, it's the opposite. We, we have more money, but you know, we're trying to achieve a goal so that, you know, we can reach our next round of funding and, mm -hmm. um, the, to train people that have absolutely no experience, uh, you know, to keep them safe in the lab, to make sure they're always supervised with a small staff and a startup is, can be a barrier. But um, because of my previous experience with LifeSci New York students, which has always been really exemplary, uh, I felt that it was important. And also it was important, I think, for our companies um, I don't know, for the, for the corporate culture to, to, to make some sort of a commitment to give back to the city in terms of uh, supporting this biotech ecosystem that we're all desperately trying to, 
to support. Um, one of the things that we found is we're having problems hiring. And part of it is I think people are unwilling to travel from California or New York, uproot their families um, and take a job in a company in a town where if the job doesn't work out, there aren't a lot of other companies they can just segue to. Right. And so it's to everybody's uh, benefit to make sure we have this strong ecosystem and training part of that is training up a workforce that is from the city and already lives in the city. And, and part of it is just, you know, making it a better place to do biotech in general. It, and I can't remember, Rich, if you said this or not, but um, it, the internship program is available to students who either attend school, right, in New York City, or are or have a re or their residence is in New York City, but they may attend school elsewhere. Is that that's right? Exactly right. It, the eligibility you need to either be a New York City resident, so people who've grown up in New York City uh, attending universities anywhere, or people who attend a university in New York City. And about eighty percent of our applicants are both. Uh, you okay. also have to be either in an undergrad or grad program, or have graduated. It had been within the past year because of the pandemic, we extended it to two years. So if you've graduated since spring of 2020 and you need to be eligible to work in the United States, either uh, as a citizen, a permanent resident, DACA, or um, having a visa allowing you to work without sponsorship. Okay. We also, we had a question from uh, Rich Miller Murphy over at the, uh, the Blood Center uh, asking about the economic cost sharing and what it might look like in 2022. And he put a uh, he put a link in the question that I'm gonna put in the chat about the program that they run in uh, in the summer for undergraduate research. Yeah, it's great. So, and we do require that every intern is paid uh, for two reasons. One, my wife's an employment lawyer. We wanna make sure we're complying with minimum <laughs> wage laws. It, much more importantly is we wanna make sure that there aren't students who are stuck flipping burgers for the summer because they can't afford an industry focused uh, or a career focused internship. Yep. So we're really, we're thrilled that uh, EDC not only created the program, but also created a subsidy fund where we subsidize the cost of interns. And the way we work that is we'll subsidize full cost of $15 an hour, um, either for R&D positions, because those are the most desired, or for CUNY undergraduates. So we love mm -hmm. helping our CUNY students. Uh, we'll give a half subsidy of seven fifty an hour for other students. And to be eligible, companies either need to be a small nonprofit or they need to um, have fewer than 10 employees and not yet have raised a Series A round uh, just because Pfizer doesn't need our subsidies. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. That's, un that's understandable. And I think you, you highlighted a, a good thing here. And I want to give just a little bit of a shout out to, well, it's actually a rather large shout out to the EDC because this was really, I think, impeccably well planned, right? They did a really good job of putting the right things into these programs and, you know, the things that were, you know, going to matter and make things, you know, pretty seamless on, on the other end. And I know it was completely seamless, but they did a really good job of specking out the details of things. And it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't a shell with vague hand-waving. They did a really good job of setting up the whole program. So Emmanuel, I wanted to, to come over to you here for a minute because you you hit on something that I think was important. So you were at Cornell Tech, right? And it's you know the, it, for anyone that hasn't been there, the campus is is spectacular. It's it's a really great institution. Um, although you know at the time that it was started, it wasn't really life sciences focused. And you know if anybody's ever been to Roosevelt Island, it is not exactly some place that gets a lot of foot traffic from people. Uh, uh, from people during the day, you know, Kendall Square, it is not. So what was it like to try and integrate from uh, from Roosevelt Island and, and to kind of get noticed and get involved in the ecosystem from Cornell Tech? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I actually applied to Cornell Tech because I was really interested in levering technology in the uh, substance abuse prevention space. So that's kind of, you know, my big pitch to the university. And then when I got there, there was an overwhelming amount of technical talent, you know, very talented engineers and, you know, uh, MBAs, you know, medical students. But what I saw is that every person that had a health science or biotech uh, pitch or idea 
quickly they would form groups around them with these talented engineers because mm-hmm. these engineers just really loved the uh you know the mission of creating something that actually impacts people's health and lives so uh i got a, i got some great practice in the life science industry uh for example i used to go to, to nyu all the time with their incubator they have a um a life science incubator over there and i would be yep. visiting startups over there working with them and uh new york city was i saw the new york city the edc was already a couple of years strong i think at that point so yeah i began to really fall into this ecosystem and then once i started to approach graduation um and then i, I received the internship at uh you know from the story that you already heard with a to a pharma uh, it just the gifts kept on coming where all of the different uh, meetups we would have and then you would have people from Sloan Kettering and, uh, you know, uh, prominent oncology hospitals, you know, uh, people at Merck, the head of oncology, I would meet at these meetups, you know, have conversations, make connections. And then it kind of made me think like, wow, uh, this is people, you know, they're they're hidden, but when they congregate, they're they're very, uh, they're very strong. So uh, it definitely was receptive. The city was very receptive to to the initiative of wanting to stay and, and work in life sciences. I think you hit on something really important, which is I think there's a lot of, I think finding the enthusiasm and the passion around life sciences here is reasonably easy to do. And you know, when you find that enthusiasm and that passion with, with like-minded people, groups coalesce pretty quickly. Um, so, I actually want to get into what both of your your companies do, but we just got a question that I think is uh, really relevant, Rich. So I'm going to throw this one to you. You know, is there a focus on diversity? And you know, what is the what's what are the stats on kind of the student level or background uh, within the program? And you know, finally, this is a multi part question. This isn't just me asking multiple questions at once, which I do sometimes. Um, the the last part of it are how do you map the applicants to jobs? So maybe we talk a little bit about kind of the diversity and the stats in the process, and then I want to get into what uh, what Ellen and Emmanuel's companies do and their experience there. Right, and I think Erica's question hits on basically every issue about the program, uh, and I could talk for an hour just answering her a few questions, but. Uh, it, you know, actually picking up what you asked Emmanuel, Derek, about Cornell Tech and just the challenge of integrating fits in perfectly with Erica's question about diversity. Mm-hmm. You know, but back when we could go in person to career fairs and we missed doing so and got one this year, which was great to be back. But you know, we would go to career fairs at every university. We're going to about three dozen different career fairs or holding our own info sessions on campuses throughout New York City, as well as recruiting at SUNY schools because half of their students are New York City residents. We'd go to Columbia and NYU and there'd be hundreds of companies chasing after the same students and you know, completely get lost in the shuffle. And then you go to City College or Baruch or Lehman College or you know, some of the amazing CUNY stu- schools meet these incredible students and they're just a handful of organizations recruiting, almost no corporations, It's city agencies and nonprofits. And so there we'd meet all these great students who are just really excited about the opportunity. And so in terms of diversity, yeah, that's a huge focus for us. Uh, Just did a federal grant proposal. 90% of our uh, place students and our applicants meet the federal uh, definition of historically underserved communities, which is- 90%? Yeah, so basically uh, they they include women and, non-whites and Hispanics. So it's 90%. If you look just at, um, at, at women last year, 62% of our interns were women and 71% of our interns are non-white. So it's a huge focus for ours. We're not exclusively uh, a diversity program, but it's a real focus for us to recruit students, as we say, that reflect New York City. And also to Ellen's point, we really make an effort to find students who don't have an uncle who's a, an executive at a pharmaceutical company and really to provide opportunities for everyone. In, in terms of the student background, about three quarters of our applicants are undergrads, somewhat evenly split. We, um, we get more juniors and seniors, but also some freshmen and sophomores, and then a number of master's students, as well as a handful of doctoral students. Uh, we do recruit at 
uh, Columbia College, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, community colleges, challenges, it's harder for us to find hosts who are willing to take community college students. So especially if there's anyone out there who might be interested in taking students who really are getting their first experience, uh, we love those hosts and we're always looking for more. Uh, in terms of mapping applicants to jobs, uh, that's really a critical part of what we do. And it's what Sharon Kaplan, our program director, and our team have done just really a masterful job at doing. Um, to Ellen's point, you know, in looking at how to get companies to participate, definitely the, the subsidy fund is a critical one. The other is we know that everyone in a company is incredibly busy and no one's primary focus is finding interns. You're busy building a company, you're busy you know, satisfying investors or finding investors. Uh, interns are nice to have as long as it's super easy. So we handle all the recruiting. We do the first screen of finding uh, those applicants that we think are best for each company, pass them on to the company and it's the company's choice. But I think our real special sauce is basically acting as a headhunter in the same way that a senior recruiter would do for C-level positions, but mm -hmm. doing that for entry-level talent and putting yeah. in that same level of effort of finding the right fit of um, candidates for companies passing on a very small number of candidates to the company and then letting the company make the, whatever interviewing they wanna do and whatever final decisions. Um, the greatest mark of how good our matching is, is that about half of our interns get offers to continue at their companies at the end of their internship. Emmanuel, um, there, there, there's no better segue to go to, to Emmanuel yeah. here, yes? <laughs> yeah, and that's our dream to have someone who not only continues at their company, but becomes the host hiring other interns. <laughs> yeah. So Emmanuel, you're, you're teed up on that one. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, uh, about your experience and then, and then follow with a little bit about what you're doing now at A2A and then Ellen will go over to you. Totally, thank you. So uh, yeah, picking up after I got connected. Well, remember I got rejected from the first one. So I was kind of like, okay, that's not gonna work out. But then they actually responded, this is a better company for you. And they were right. I mean, they're, uh, they're chemistry focused, computationally focused. And, uh, you know, like, uh, like Ellen was mentioning, transitioning from an academic background to an industry focus, even in computational chemistry and machine learning was, was no easy feat. So my first project was uh, building models to predict the drug likeness of molecules, given their two-dimensional structure, mm -hmm. uh, which was intense. I had, to I had to learn how to use all these new packages but uh, you know, I kept showing up and I kept just learning as much as I could. And uh, at, the, at the end of the internship, I had some success. Uh, you know, I made a presentation and the team sat down. They're like, okay, yeah, we wanna um, offer him a full-time position. And so around that time, I was purely machine learning focused and the company actually took the opportunity to invest in me a computational, a formal comp computational chemistry background training. So that came with molecular modeling, dynamics, uh, you know, pharmacophore modeling, medicinal chemistry, the whole, the whole uh, smorgasbord of drug hunter expertise mm -hmm. that I, um, I really dug my teeth into over the, the next six months. Um, so between September and like March of, of uh, 2020, and by that time, I submitted my first molecules for synthesis, and uh, and they got created, and uh, we were making oncology drugs. So it was, uh, I mean, there was absolutely no better opportunity for me in the entire universe, I think. <laughs> it's like, you know, ask anyone a year after graduation, even in a big pharma company, are you submitting molecules for synthesis against novel targets? Uh, it's it's hard to do. So well, that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, that, um, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was it was an incredible moment. And then uh, it continued coming. So slowly I started getting uh, more opportunity. And uh, just to show that this does pay New York City back. Uh, this isn't just a one way thing. You know, EDC doesn't invest in us and we don't give it back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our company, uh, our spinoff company, Biomia Fusion, was listed on the New York Stock Exchange this past uh, April. And on top of that, um, we also struck a deal with a Korean pharmaceutical company called uh, Daewoo Pharma, mm -hmm. where, uh, yeah, so there's milestones up front and then, you know, still working on these projects. And like Richard mentioned, 
this past summer, I had the, the joy of hiring two interns from the Life Science New York City uh, program. So uh, one of them was a CUNY student named Silu, one of the most talented software engineers I've ever met. And, uh, and then also, you know, just to show you the diversity, a master's student in bioinformatics from Carnegie Mellon. So we had, you know, this incredible team where we made the software package and uh, we, we made a lot of progress this summer. And I mean, I have to, you know, once again, just thank uh, everybody here for, for making that possible. That's and great. And you took the Carnegie Mellon student fun. because another CUNY student wasn't available? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only if there were more. <laughs> Hard to find. Um, one, one question, and I know, um, I know that it's come up recently, right, is with the pandemic, virtual versus in person. So you said you had a great experience with your two interns this past summer. Were they, was it a combination? Were they all virtual? How did you all handle that at A2A? Uh, that's a great question. So when the pandemic hit and a year ago, uh, you know, we were really trying to, to batten down the hatches with spending. Yeah. So we were like, okay, no more office. We're just going to go virtual. And then boom, two weeks later, the pandemic happened. So, uh, well, it really came in full swing. So we actually didn't have a, uh, an official meeting place in New York, but we would just meet at different like lunch spots once a month and uh, do a little bit of business, have a little bit of lunch. And uh, so our interns were entirely remote, except for uh, uh, Silu. He lives in, uh, in Brooklyn. He would come in and we, we brought him to, to different um, you know, team meetings versus our Carnegie Mellon student was in Pittsburgh, a little bit harder to, to schedule. Yeah. But uh, it did bring its challenges, uh, particularly in kind of introducing to them the team culture and you know, the, the, the fun part of working in a startup, something that kind of has taken a slow decline as uh, you know, the longer we've been virtual, but we're starting to pick back up with in-person things. And Ellen, what about you all? Um, what, what has your experience been throughout the pandemic with um, hosting interns and growing a startup? Well, it, it, it's interesting. Our, our startup is focused on um, supply chains and there has been so much talk about supply chains. So oh, yes. in a weird way, it's actually been um, really good for, for our company to have everyone more aware of how important supply chain um, security and traceability is. So uh, we, we actually as a company have done, done quite well. We just closed on our series A and uh, uh, we during yeah, during the oh, thank you That's during wonderful. the height of the pandemic uh, we we di we didn't didn't host any interns that first summer, but uh, once the the vaccine became available, basically everyone in the company is vaccinated, and you know we ask that the interns um, be vaccinated as well, and so we've been able to host interns um, all through this past summer and now in the fall, and. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, sort of circle back to in terms of um, the quote unquote burden of training interns is I had an, one of the LifeSci New York interns from uh, my nonprofit, uh, Arietta, um, was the first person that we hired first as an intern, not through LifeSci New York, but just because I'd kept in contact with her at this company when we first started, uh, she is now our laboratory manager. And basically I just take all the life sign New York interns and say, okay, Ari, you're gonna train them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically she knows exactly where they've been and can bring them up to speed. And um, that's how I handle the training of new interns is I give them all <laughs> to the person who was an intern and can, can <laughs> fulfill that function. Um, and so we've had, uh, let's see, we had two interns over the summer. Uh, we offered both of them a job in the fall uh, if they could, you know, have some time aside from their classes. Uh, one of them was able to do it, Syed. Um, Michael was not able to because his classes were, he had too much classwork. Uh, and then we have also hired another couple of interns um, from the program, um, Gurleen and Asha. So 
we now have three interns working from the program at the moment. And uh, I think the screening process and the matching process, as Emmanuel said, is really critical. It saves us a lot of work. And uh, also looking at the skills of the interns because we get to see their resumes and their cover letters and what they're interested in. And we get to talk to them about it. And we, we try to play to their strengths. Um, uh, one of our interns is good at programming and we've sort of matched her up with one of our technicians who's also good at programming and they're working on a laboratory robot together. Um, and you know, the other one really wants to do wet work. So we're getting her more involved in the actual wet work in the lab. So uh, it, it, I think it works out wonderfully um, and I would, I would recommend it to any company to at least uh, try taking in an intern and seeing how it goes before you make any judgments about how hard it's gonna be or, or how much you're gonna to have to train people. You know, and you mentioned the, the, the previous interns training the other interns, right? And it's a, little, it's a little humorous, but actually that's kind of the point, right? As the program grows and as there's more recognition, as there's people that continue to host uh, interns, you do get this kind of buildup of shared knowledge. And, and honestly, the flywheel gets easier. You get people that are more familiar with the problem, not the problem. You get people that are more familiar with the program, more familiar with students, more familiar with kind of best practices of onboarding people. And it should get easier and it should just grow. So it is funny that you say, yes, I have the intern train the rest of the interns. But ultimately, in one sense, that's kind of the point eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so important. I always think of it as a foot in the door, going back to my, my story as a kid. It's like, if I hadn't had that foot in the door, I don't know if I would have had this career, you mm -hmm. know? And it's that first lab that you get into a lot of times, because then I don't know how many recommendations I've written for kids after this, because a lot of them uh, want to go into a different internship maybe, and they, they need a recommendation, or maybe they're, they're going for a job, or they're going for medical school, or they're going for something else. And they will circle back to me and say, you know, will you be one of the people that will write me a recommendation? And it's not that all of them are headed for, I, I, there was a question in the chat about uh, sort of the elite nature of biotech. And biotech runs the gamut. I mean, you have people that want to make money immediately. They want to get into a technician position. They're not headed for a PhD. They want a job. They want a good job right away. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll go for something later in their, their career. But right now they want to get into the workforce. And then you have people who really do have their sights set on either an MD or a PhD program. And that's fine too. But, but you'll find that whole gamut within the Life Sign New York um, group of students. I think one and of the we'll biggest things. Um, go ahead, Jim. Go we'll ahead. Place both science students and what we call business or management students. So it's not just science roles. It's also marketing or business or finance or uh, communications, IT, computer science, data science. So a range of positions. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things with with science, especially with with younger scientists, is access and opportunity. Right, you, you, I, I think there's the idea of wanting to be in science, but frankly, you don't really know what it is or what you're doing until you do it. And unless yes. someone gives you that opportunity to do it the first time, you, you don't know what that is. I mean, molecular biology sounds like a really cool concept, but until you actually sit there and do it, you, you don't necessarily realize what the different branches of, of science entail. You know, anyone who saw kind of the first Iron Man movie kind of thinks of that, how people, you know, kind of that's how people do engineering. But until you actually, you know, get to try and, you know, prototype something a hundred times and realize it still doesn't work, you realize there's a lot more work and maybe slightly less glamor to it than that. And that's just as valuable because you're investing a lot of time as a student pointing towards a particular career. And it's better if you find out now that maybe you don't want to do that. I had one really good student, not from LifeSci New York, but from another program who went into science policy instead, you know? So, cause she didn't like lab work, 
but she was, you know, very interested in science, but just from yeah. more of a policy perspective. Yeah. One of the most valuable internships can be one that you hate because it shows yeah. you, uh, yeah. you know, I don't want to be doing this. Yeah. You real or the one where you realize kind of how deep the well goes, right? You know, the actual the actual difficulty of answering a very complex question by starting with a series of, of very you know simple questions or the questions that are answerable. And you realize very quickly that there are different approaches to try and even get a decent answer to one piece of that puzzle. You know, ultimately you realize that science is hard and the well tends to go a lot deeper than most people realize. So I'm not a scientist. And in building this program, like I came out of Columbia Business School and basically every second of every day at Columbia Business School is focused on preparing students for the jobs that are out there. And in looking at this industry, I was blown away at how bad a job the universities do of training students for jobs. And there's, in some cases, an opposition for doing so. There's a feeling of, you know, we don't want students going to industry. Um, a lot of students will just end up in going into science because they liked it in high school, or they might think that they're pre-med or maybe want to go into academia. But the universities don't know what to do with science students. They say tech firms, consulting firms, and banks actively recruit. We have no idea what to do with science students. And the faculty members have no idea what jobs are out there. Uh, a professor at Lehman College told us, you know, she'll get students who start out pre-med and either they don't get into med school or they decide they don't want to go to med school. They'll come to her saying what jobs are out there. And what she told us is she's never worked a day of her life in industry. She doesn't know what the jobs are and she doesn't know how to prepare students for those jobs. Right. And so a, a big part of what we do is just educate students of the wide range of jobs that are available for science students. So when you apply for our program, you get to look at a list of all of the available opportunities, which at its peak is a few hundred opportunities each year. And just doing that exposes you to the, the real wide range of different job opportunities there are and career paths there are in the science industry. Yeah. I think one of the best things about science is that it's so vast and you could do anything. And I think one of the hardest things about science from a career perspective is that it's so vast and you can do anything. So I, I empathize with the folks, especially at the undergrad level, where a lot of it is either introductory courses or anything where you feel, well, you have to teach them you know, this, you have to teach them this area of biology, you have to teach them this area of chemistry. And then by the time you get to the point where you're a senior, you maybe have some laboratory experience and you've maybe started to scratch the surface, but you know, it, it's difficult to, it, it, I, I empathize with the difficulty of saying, oh, we should, we should train people for X kind of jobs because if you're training somebody for one type of job, perhaps you're not training them for another type. There's an infinite number of trade-offs and there's almost no real correct answer. You have to make, you have to make some very hard decisions in order to do them. And but I think Richard makes, oh, sorry, yeah, go Richard, go for it, yeah. Richard makes a really good point though, that um, I'll just jump in that, you know, the biotech industry is really young. I mean, when I was a graduate student in the late 1970s, early 1980s, I remember the, the one person from our program who went into industry and it was like, oh my God, because <laughs> it, it used to be that everybody would just go right into academia. And that attitude in a lot of departments, even after all this time, still hasn't really changed. It's that th there's, there's, um, even though that the biotech industry, now people are aware of it, of course, um, I think really the, the feeling is that people, that, that sort of the better way to go is to, is to go into, it used to be only the failures in biology would go into industry and they would work, you know, in uh, animal toxicology or something like that um, until the biotech industry came along and made it, um, quite frankly, a more sexy career choice. But mm -hmm. that 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 attitude still persists. That you know, if you're if you're in the halls of academia, that you should sort of segue into that. And if you go into an industrial uh, job or a postdoc or something, that you'll never come back out. There there isn't a, a really clear path to segue back and forth between academia and industry. Um, where I think in in certain other 
fields, the, the path is clearer. So uh, I do think that that's something that um, Life Science New York does address and is really important. Is that 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 connection between academia and industry that's missing? Yeah. Quite frankly, and don't you think though that that schools are recognizing that sort of void in their ability to connect? And I I do think we've seen we've certainly had guests on this program, academia that have talked about their increased focus on entrepreneurship and their willingness to sort of show students that there are other paths than just going into the traditional. Um, I, I think we're seeing more of that. Now, whether it's enough, that's a separate question, I think, right? Yep. And whether or not they're preparing them for that, that path, again. And, and again, four, four years of college is not, like as you said, there's so much background material that they need to know. It's, and, there's, and the colleges themselves have a limited number of labs. And, by the way, funding for academia, you know, you, it's like, what is it? One in 10 people get their grants uh, on the first try. So Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're laser focused on getting that grant. It's even harder than a startup that's focused on getting funding in a way. And so you don't have a lot of bandwidth to take in students that you have to train because mm -hmm. you're trying to get those experiments done to get your next grant. And so the limited opportunity within the universities themselves for, for placing students in labs is a problem too. So um, having them linked to outside places where they can give students those opportunities, I think is, is critical, particularly these programs that are churning students out in the New York area that are supposedly uh, master's degrees in biotech. And they're supposed to go into the biotech industry. Yeah, we yeah. we've had several questions um, or just got a little bit of a discussion in the um, in the chat. The chat's about, lively today. I know we we got I'm not, we're having trouble reading it all. It's coming in so fast um, <laughs> about um, opportunities in sort of the K through twelve or nine through twelve, right? And while this program is specifically focused on. Um, college students or grad students, um, there are some, there are opportunities for New York City um, students. And in fact, N New York Bio has an equity, diversity and inclusion task force. And so we're, we're in the process of developing programs for that. And one resource we have found is the New York City Science Research Mentoring Consortium, um, which is run out of the uh, Natural History Museum, um, primarily, I think, funded from the Pinkerton Foundation. And um, works with a number of, and works with universities like Rockefeller, as well as other, um, other um, uh, entities to try and get high school students interested, right, and into, um, into labs and into science exposure. So I just wanted to, to respond to some of those questions that had come up. And I have experience with that program too, because my former nonprofit, GenSpace, is still sponsoring um, students in that yeah. program. So, yeah, we, we have to do it all. Too. I think that that's, yeah, I think that's one, yeah. I, I think the takeaway is we have to start earlier and we need to be going into communities that have fewer historical um, students that choose science as a career path so that we're, we're making it more available to a broader section. And then Rich is going to even have more applicants <laughs> at the college level for the internships. And then we need I've, had, I've had students that came through me through that program and then went on to Rich's program. So, yeah, so okay, we're, so, we're creating our own yeah. pipelines. Yes. Yeah, and we, we definitely recruit from programs like that. Um, back when Anita and I did our strat planning in 2017, we, we hit upon the science research mentorship program and it's yeah. fabulous. And now like when high school students come to us looking for internships, we'll send them to natural history or to any of the, uh, the partner organizations. And what they're yeah. doing is amazing and kudos to Pinkerton for funding it. Uh, also shout out to Biobus. This is just an amazing organization. Yes. Uh, they have a dual mission of helping young students learn about science, but also hiring older students to, to be the counselors and teachers teaching the younger students. And yeah. they've been a, a fabulous partner of ours. A point. Uh, we actually found, you know, there's still need for, there's always need for more, but, uh, we found a lot of programs at the K through 12 level and really nothing at the, the collegiate level. Mm -hmm. 
Emmanuel. If I could add a, thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, something as someone who was on the inside of some of these programs, a point that I want to highlight is the, the friendship and community that the students build in the cohort. Uh, for example, in Life Science NYC, there's like a boot camp that we go through. I was fortunate enough to be in the in-person boot camp. And, uh, and yeah, so I would be walking down the city in Soho or Chelsea, and I would see people who also work in the life science industry. And you go, oh, hey, how's your company doing? You know, are you guys hiring? And like, oh, yeah, we're looking for talent. Do you know anyone? And, uh, and it, it makes the city a lot more inclusive for, for people. So you're not really wandering around all these business people, et cetera. Networking, networking, networking. Yep. Yep. Yes. You know, um, at one of our events recently, two of our loyal hosts um, already knew each other, but they spoke at the event and through that have developed a partnership that's not yet announced, but something we're really excited about that, you know, not only have they been great partners at bringing in hosts, but because of the program, uh, they're working on a business partnership. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's fantastic. Also bring not to, together. Not to, not to toot our own horn here, but you know, you, you look at the way that New York City is, is laid out and, and things are, you know, the, the universities aren't next to each other. Things are a little bit more spread out. The companies aren't necessarily all next to each other. So, you know, it's one of the things within our mission to really kind of help, you know, bring everybody together because, you know, like somebody just said in the, in the chat, the energy of in-person kind of can't be underestimated and the importance of, you know, kind of being able to serve that function of, Kind of making sure those high value collisions happen is something that that we try and do a lot of so um it's it's good to hear and i think the more that we have i, I the, the more that this program grows just the, the better and better that's going to be so we have a great so this is it's not quite a softball question but i think we can actually you know use this as our as our wrap up so thanks so much to uh anita kishore who i think some of you may be familiar with so she said, how can this community of companies and organizers, you know, number one, create real world training opportunities in New York City for college students? And number two, start this internal internship program. Uh, and it only takes one person in the organization to make it happen. So why don't we kind of go around the horn a little bit for, you know, things we want to see, you know, out of this community and out of, out of this specific function to kind of make New York even better than it already is. So uh, I'll jump uh, Rich, in first, uh, and acknowledging Anita is my partner. This was not a setup question, <laughs> uh, but I, I would say, you know, really all it takes is um, reaching out to us and we're happy to walk you through it. We, we see our mission as, you know, we want to create more opportunities for students and really help companies. And we go every extra mile to make it as easy as possible for companies. So in thinking about what training opportunities, if you talk to us, we're happy to share best practices. We're happy to share other companies' experiences to help you get set up. Sharon's amazing at working with companies. If you send a job description that we think doesn't meet the mark, we'll help you rewrite it to make sure that it's yeah. uh, in line to attract the right students. And she's basically performing the role of a, a real high class a uh, recruiter, but for entry-level talent, something that really just doesn't otherwise exist because companies wouldn't pay for it, the candidates wouldn't pay for it, but we're extraordinarily fortunate that EDC is funding this program, which makes it completely free for companies to participate. There's no cost apart from paying the students and there could be the subsidy available. Uh, and we do as much of the work as possible for you and there's no obligation. So if you don't find candidates that you like, there's no obligation to hire. So you know, if you work with us, we'll help make it as easy as possible. Uh, and as she says, as Anita says, it only takes one person in the organization to make it happen. You know, there we rely on those heroes, those people in companies who uh, who want to have interns and just take it upon themselves to start a program. Yep. I want to add only... a shout out to Sharon. Go Sharon is amazing. She's absolutely amazing. And she's always available. She answers my emails immediately and she smooths everything over. I have an idea that, that I wanna float that may, may be true in some of the incubators in New York City. But I think that all of the incubator spaces, particularly those funded by um, EDC, um, should be required to take an intern from this program. All the companies that, that, that 
are in these participating incubators. I don't know if that's true right now, uh, like the J&J &J and Launch Labs and all the incubators in the city. <laughs> it, it's not true right now, though. A lot of them have, and um, they've all been fabulous partners. And you know, again, kudos to EDC. The work that they've done in the past few years has made our lives so much easier just because there are so many more companies. And if you think yeah. back to 2017 when we were starting, there was Launch Labs. There wasn't J Labs. There, uh, I guess there was also Harlem Biospace and SUNY Downstate. But so many more incubators have lit up. And with that has come that many more companies, that many more opportunities. And, and it's just a real credit to the city for, for making so much progress in the past few years. Yep. I, it, it's been, the last few years have been amazing. Um, so Emmanuel, why don't we go over to you? Yeah, I was just thinking about this question. Uh, the, the main incentive I can offer is if you're a company in the New York City area, this is a no brainer. Uh, an email to Rich is, you know, it takes about, you know, two minutes to write if you're being polite. And, uh, <laughs> and you will not find a better, you know, cost for your time anywhere in New York City uh, because, you know, they do the headhunting and they provide the $15 stipend. I found a, a second year master student from Carnegie Mellon and a React JavaScript front end engineer that was phenomenal. And we got we got an entire product off the ground. Our company is five people. And I, I uh, you know took two of the interns and one of them was working on uh, a deep graph convolution across molecular graphs, which sounds confusing because it is. And we were able to get this student hands-on experience, you know, while I was managing other programs. I was not devoted to these interns. These interns were autonomous because we selected them for autonomy. And that's what we said in the interview. They were very talented. Like, are you comfortable with kind of like, you know, being independent? Yes. And they were phenomenal. Um, and so I think if, if a company wants to grow and they have an idea that they want to get off the ground, there's no better place. And we will have, um, and just so everyone, Rich put his um, his email in the in the chat for folks. But we'll also have on our website um, the the links that you all need if to to reach out and to learn more about the details of hosting um, interns. So yeah, we'll also we'll also we'll put this. this we'll we'll get it to you. We will also put this uh, this conversation up both on on LinkedIn uh, and on Twitter through our YouTube channel. Uh, this is something where, you know, Rich, credit to you and Anita and the rest of your team. You are one of the most accessible uh, and easy to find and easy to work with organizations, you know, I, I would imagine on the planet. You make it so easy uh, for, for people to work with you and it's virtually seamless. So uh, if anyone is is out there and looking for more here or if you if you need to put people in touch with us, we're on Twitter at New York Bio and we're also very easy to connect with. We have Rich's... Uh, email in the chat. So I would say just as a, as, as a final word here, I, I couldn't be more excited that the EDC put together uh, this comprehensive program and that you all have been a part of it. Um, so since we have one minute left, uh, Rich, why don't you close us out today? Yeah, a few closing thoughts. One is a uh, huge, huge credit to the folks at EDC, Sue, Sue Rosenthal, Carlo Uvienko, who just had a baby, congrats, Carlo, and uh, Miko Belos, this has been amazing. Um, same too, Anita has been fabulous, uh, and Sharon Kaplan. We've, we have a growing team. Uh, Arlie Cornell Hall just started with us. We've hired someone new uh, to expand our team, which we're really excited about. And just back to something Ellen said at the beginning, it's amazing how basically everyone in industry that we sp speak with, when we explain the program, you can see their eyes light up and they, you can see them thinking and what everyone says, almost these ex identical words are, I wish that had been around when I was in college. Yeah. Yep. And um, you know, we're here now, we're, we're thrilled to be here and um, we're real excited, we're growing. We placed 140 students last year and you know, the program continues to grow and we're really excited to be here. And thank you again, Jenna, for and Derek for, for hosting us. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, we learned a lot and I think we have, um, now we have more work to do to share with our colleagues more about the, um, about the program. So hopefully you'll have even more placements next summer. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. And, and it's day. also, thanks, uh, we're, going year -round. we're doing year round placements as well. Thank okay. you. 
Excellent. Great. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.